So I've had the honor and the privilege of being asked to speak on Storm Proof, Strengthen, Adapt and Survive, Hurricane Tips to Strengthen and Protect Your Home and Belongings. Um, diving directly into the presentation, I always like to start by asking, why does this matter? Uh, so why does this matter? And this matters to, to each of us for different reasons. And I'd like you to put in the chat right now why this matters to you. It could be hurricanes. Why is it important? Why do we care about protecting our homes, our families? What, what, what is your reason? Is it that um, you just wanna make sure that you are safe? Is it that you have maybe a, a, a special needs or an elderly family member? Is it just that you wanna make sure your nice car doesn't get scratched? Or is it that you wanna make sure that you know how to properly underwrite or provide insurance? Safety, I see come up. What else? I hope, I'm sure Family Guardian aren't shy, right? I wouldn't expect um, that the top insurance company in the country would be shy. Severe weather can cause total disaster, 100% agree. So we all would have different reasons for why this is important to us. And these are my two little reasons. It would come down to family, my, uh, it's my daughter and my son. And ultimately this is important to me because there is a need, one, for me to do as much as possible to protect them in the event or when these storms happen, and two, to make sure that as much as possible, there is a Bahamas that is left for them that looks like the beautiful sun, sand, sea, and paradise that we have come to enjoy. Because the reality of it is, we are living in a very different world that is rapidly changing, one that I often remind myself of with this little cartoon that is up um, in the office uh, that says that good news, uh, the sharks having a conversation at this rate, then we, they can expect to swim up and potentially have a meal of their own in the next five years. We in the Bahamas are blessed to be in this small low-lying nation that um, is obviously dominated by wonderful turquoise waters and white sands, but unfortunately that puts us in the top 10 most to be impacted by climate change over the next two decades. That top 10 list is one that allows our beaches to be on uh, world renown and brings obviously millions of tourists to our shores, but it puts us obviously in a very high risk and a high vulnerability for what we've come to see is an increasing volume and frequency of storms. So the presentation this afternoon, um, as we walk through where we are, where we're going and translate that into actionable opportunities um, to be better prepared, we'll first look at our current position overall at a high level. So from about 30,000 feet up, where we are, how this all ties together into what's happening at a macro level. And then we will look in terms of what policies and planning are currently underway uh, in the public and private sector. And then we'll look at our own personal lives and how we can be better prepared ourselves. So if that sounds good to you, uh, please type sounds good to me in the chat group. So if I don't get any response, oh, there we go. Okay, thanks. Because if it didn't sound good, I would just pack it up and say, thank you all, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Great, good. So thank you for working with me. Um, this is the World Bank's estimation on the impact um, by introducing resiliency. So investing in infrastructure, and infrastructure includes our houses, by the way, improving the way we currently build, as well as making sure that we put in place the resilient infrastructure, whether it's seawalls, roads, et cetera, that help to protect us. Um, so the net benefit of, of $4.2 4 trillion um, is something that is foreseen if we do not step forward and step up in terms of low and middle income houses. So the cost of one decade of inaction is approximately $1 trillion if we continue to build a stock of low resilient infrastructure. And so that's just a very wordy way of saying we have to be intentional about how we approach our future state 
um, as we've seen this rapid intensification of storms, we've seen the frequency increase. And of course, we've seen from the Dorians, the Matthews, the Joaquins, that this isn't something that's just a small trend, but it's one that we're seeing uh, is projected to increase in the future. So this is a track record, a plot of the storms that have passed over our small but very significant country since 1850. And you can see this looks like some type of plot that would have done, been done with a crayon by maybe my daughter or son. But these are hurricane tracks. Each line and each color represents the intensity. And you can see it almost totally colors in our nation, right? Um, three of the top most impacted places in the entire world for hurricanes, and we're talking about Atlantic hurricanes, uh, is Eleuthera, Abaco, and Grand Bahama. And so we are definitely on every list and at the top of most of those lists as it relates to the need to take this seriously, the need to be prepared, and the need to chart out a way of life that takes into account these factors and these forces um, that nature is sending our way. The reality of the situation is um, the world, and obviously we're a part of that, goes through cycles, right? They're called ice ages. And I'm sure we've all seen some Armageddon movies, um, like the world is not enough, et cetera, where the world freezes over. The last time we would have gone through an ice age was about 11 to 20,000 years ago. So believe it or not, that's not as long as people might think, right? 11 to 20,000 years ago. And so we are going into the next ice age. Um, just like hurricanes come, just like fires happen, the world will freeze over again. And we've survived it as humans before. We'll survive it again. Um, the, the part we play is hopefully not speeding that up. Right, So there's been a lot of discussion around climate change and is it real, et cetera. And so we obviously have the opportunity to help to prepare ourselves and to be more resilient um, for when that ice age comes, which obviously wouldn't be in any of our lifetimes. But we also have the pressure of not speeding it up. And we know just due to the increase in greenhouse gases and, and uh, carbon dioxide emissions, that there has been a rapid increase in um, certain types of gases, as well as global temperatures, which obviously melt ice caps, et cetera. So, you know, if you drop enough ice cubes in a bowl and they all melt uh, and you continue that trend, then eventually the bowl will overflow. This is from a report that was just issued um, two weeks ago, uh, establishing the disaster profile for the Bahamas. So this is in 2016 dollars. So this is approximately the economic impact from damage alone of the most significant storms for us. And you can see the big ticket items, as we know, Dorian, which would have been the largest and most impactful hurricane in our country's history and um, the most intense storm in the history of tracking Atlantic hurricanes. It's tied for number one. Um, and you can see the impact of $2.5 billion and uh, the other impact. So we all know that it's real. We can see the dollar values. We can also see how quickly 15, 16, 20, right? Versus 04, 92, 99. So um, we can clearly see that the numbers are trending to um, a much more significant increase and a much more uh, frequent increase versus the past. So, this is a picture just to remind us, and we all have seen many of these pictures of, you know, this is Hurricane Matthew post, um, uh, post Matthew in Grand Bahama, just the impact and each picture paints a different story. So this paints the story of what happens to our vegetation, to our soil. Um, we obviously know that homes and et cetera were impacted, um, but this reminds us that this has long-term impacts on our agriculture and fisheries. Believe it or not, coral reefs, which help to protect us, also take or have significant damage from these types of storms, um, which obviously increases or significantly uh, impacts uh, coral as well as fisheries habitat and, and fishery numbers. We can see that clearly vegetation is significantly impacted. 
Um, we have what's called storm surge and saltwater inundation. And salt is toxic, as you can imagine, for plants as it is for us. We can only take certain amounts of salt. And if we get too much of it, then it makes us unhealthy and makes us sick. And so there are you know, significant impacts as it relates to the, the, the landscape and the terrestrial and aquatic aspects. We can see this photo from Dorian. So we talked obviously about those, the three most recent ones, Dorian, uh, Matthew and Joaquin. And this is a very telltale sign of what can happen um, to our homes, to our infrastructure, et cetera, um, whether they're built to code or not. These are still lives. These are still uh, people's homes. And so it's a reminder of, of, of what is possible uh, if we don't take this seriously. And this is Hurricane Joaquin. This is Inagua, where my uh, family is from. You can see on the left or on the right, that's a picture of a sandy beach that was there before the hurricane. And you can see on the right, all the sand's gone and it hasn't come back yet. And so there are major changes in obviously the impacts of tourism, the impacts of the, the, the various opportunities to enjoy recreational activities. Uh, and we'll see similar shifts across our islands. Um, as the years evolve and as we adjust to this new climate and this new environment. So what does the math look like in terms of planning um, and looking forward? Uh, the IDB in a study in 2016 forecasted that the Bahamian economy, it would cost us approximately $500 million annually by 2025. Obviously, in 2016, that was a decade later, but now we're halfway there. We're actually closer to halfway there than, than back then. So in about four years from now, the forecast for the impact of climate change, so that's everything from hurricanes to, to flooding to, and that's even nuisance fluid, flooding. Like when we have a good storm here, you know, we have uh, parts of Pinewood, parts of South Beach that flood. You know, there's no hurricane anywhere in sight, right? All of that has an economic impact. People's houses flood, et cetera. So I don't know who's seen a budget recently, but there's nowhere on a national budget that I have seen that has $500 million to cover those types of costs. And that was the projection um, back in 2016 of what, when that would be added. So we all will pay one way or another is the long and short of it, uh, whether it's having to repair our homes, whether it's increased taxes to cover these expenses, whether it's borrowing out of our NIB fund to cover certain types of infrastructure, or whether it's taking out international loans, this is a part of our reality. It's what it takes to live in a low-lying, beautiful, tropical nation, and is a burden that we carry. A burden that we is not too heavy for us, but we have to be intentional about how we lift it. So the long and short of that, what we, climate change is real, and obviously we're living proof of it. There's no, I don't think, surprise in any Bahamian or resident's mind that um, something's happening and it's getting more serious. Sea levels are definitely higher than they were in the past, and uh, there's tons of of data that proves that and shows that. And so we know that they're slowly rising. And once again, we are going into another ice age, so they will continue to rise. Um, we can accelerate it by doing irresponsible things, or we can help to um, slow it down or even help to mitigate it by doing some responsible things. Um, but the reality is they are rising. We are a low-lying nation. The average elevation in the Bahamas is only between three and five feet above sea level. So as you can imagine, that doesn't give us very much wiggle room to play with. And a part of it is understanding that you know, and we'll look at this in the next section, um, how we can deal with that low-lying aspect of our country um, in, and, and be responsible in how we plan and build around that. Um, storms are getting more frequent and more intense. Dorian is a prime example of it. It was a category two, and then about a day and a half later, it was a category five and the most powerful storm in the world. And it sat there on top of Grand Mahama, right? No model predicted it. And um, it's still being tr trying to be understood how exactly it happened. So we know that these are the anomalies that we're seeing more frequent. And we're a small country with an increasing population that has a huge expense to, to deal with this, 
right? We don't have the $500 million a year um, that is being forecasted to, to respond to these types of events. And we know that what we've done in the past, while it's brought us to where we are and we're a very successful little nation, we know that it won't save us in the future. So what do we need to do? We need to create a climate resilient economy. And that means we must adapt. Type in the chat if you're still awake, we must adapt. Let's see if anybody's still awake or if everybody's sleeping. There we go. Two people are up, three people are up. Great. Awesome. A couple of people. Excellent. So um, how do we how do we adapt? Right? So that's a adapt is a vague type of word. You know, it sounds like okay. Um, it's something that probably has some merit behind it, but what does it really mean? It really comes down to being intentional. And we, as Bahamians, people, you know, I hear people say, oh, we don't plan for nothing. You know, we don't really take these things. We're easygoing. Um, I disagree. I think we plan for what we want and we're intentional about what we want. I mean, when John Canoe season is coming up, Obviously, it's COVID, but let's say under normal circumstances, people are in a shock from the beginning of the year, right? So we plan for what we want. When back to school is coming, the kids are there, they're getting their clocks and Jordans and new backpacks. We plan for what we want. When Christmas is coming, you know, people have their trees from weeks ahead of Christmas. People are buying their turkeys and ham uh, well ahead. We plan for what we want. When crab season is coming, people are stocking up and getting ready and preparing. When when uh, lobster season is coming, the fishermen out there are preparing their uh, traps, they're preparing all of their equipment, they're fueling up their boats so that when the day comes, they're hitting the water. When we have a visa appointment at the US Embassy, we get there on time, right? So we plan for what we want. And the same way we can plan for those events in our, that are a part of our culture, we can plan for this. So, how do we adapt? We adapt at the macro level, as I mentioned, and we adapt at the micro level. So first we look at the macro level of how we adapt. As we, you know, and we all have, I'm sure, a generation property or some property that Grammy left us in the islands, et cetera. And so it's important for us to understand how we move forward. And we don't all need to be engineers. There's, there's no reason for us all to study these things, but we all have a gut feel, right? We all have an appreciation. Um, we all have some concept of what we're comfortable with, but we'll, with what we're not. And so that's a part of it, right? The cultural shift. And we'll dive into that a bit more in a bit. So as we plan for our developments, whether it's our homes, whether it's our communities, et cetera, um, we adapt by understanding how we can respond to this changing environment, right? And um, the first approach is retreat, right? And that all sounds well and good if you um, obviously are, you're getting a new piece of property, but it's much more of a challenge if you know you have an existing home, you live somewhere on, let's say, South Beach or in Adelaide, you're near the water, you're not just going to pick up your house and move it, let's say, 50 feet back or raise it 20 feet higher, right? Um, but it's intentional for us to be aware that as we, let's say, especially plan new developments or look at doing um, expansion, building new communities, or even if it's just you buying property, right? The property might be available just because it's available, it's for sale, doesn't mean it's right for you, right? Um, so move the threat away from the development, which means you raise the site, uh, you improve the natural buffers. So you use things like beaches and wetlands uh, rather than removing them. And obviously we don't often remove beaches in the Bahamas, but we definitely have a habit of moving wetlands, what we call swamp, right? You fill in the swamp. Well, those wetlands were put there. Well, first of all, by our creator. And second of all, they help to protect significantly against storm surge, against flooding, and they help to slow and mitigate against the impact of uh, major storm surge events. So when we remove them, um, we obviously add a level of exposure that wasn't there before, and there's a reciprocal effect, right, that that has. Um, we can hold the line. So we've driven past Saunders Beach or uh, Goodman's Bay. We see seawalls all along the Orange Hill stretch. 
Um, so we understand what that coastal protection looks like, whether it's boulders in terms of revetments, or whether it's seawalls and concrete walls, or whether it's using natural buffers, such as beaches, or replanting wetlands and mangrove systems. There are a variety of ways we can tackle that. Uh, but essentially, using Mother Nature's and and uh, human um, humans intervention to to help to protect us and then it's obviously dealing with it right um, so if for example once again you live in an area you you know your house is uh, is somewhere in an area that floods frequently maybe you're in Pinewood maybe you're in um, Adelaide maybe you're somewhere else um, then how do we flood proof how do we help to make our existing structures uh, more secure both in terms of wind, but also in terms of water and being intentional about that. And we'll look at some of those ways. So these are just some images that show how we can move our and uh, plan our communities, um, how we can shift the approach of where we lay our infrastructure. And this is once again, at a high level, this is uh, how we figure out at a policy level how things are done. And these are some of the studies that tie into the upcoming revisions to our building codes and um, understanding how we will be creating geographic specific designs. Um, and so I'll break that down a little bit. Uh, and these will be things that will affect us all, as you can imagine. Um, but if you live, for example, on top of East Street Hill or Winton Hill, um, right, several hundred feet, let's say, above sea level, you're, you're, you're living in conditions that are much different than someone who lives, um, let's say, on the, on the eastern tip of the island by Yamacraw, or maybe even on the western tip of southern shores somewhere. Um, that has a, a propensity to flood, right? A propensity to flood. So there's a variety of different conditions that are significant in our country. And so understanding what infrastructure, what houses, what finished floor elevations can be built there. Let's just use that example. If you have property on top of Winton Hill, right? Um, obviously, if you're 60, 70 feet above sea level, it's okay to build a foot and a half above the crown of the road, which is our current code requirement. But if you live, let's say, in Adelaide, right, and we know Adelaide is pretty low, um, then it probably is too low to be one and a half feet above the crown of the road. And just to put it in perspective, remember I mentioned the average elevation uh, in our islands is about three to five feet above sea level. Well, our code requires the crown of the road, which is the center of the road, to be five feet above sea level, only five feet. And your finished floor elevation, so you open your door, that's your finished floor elevation, right? You step into your house, only needs to be one and a half feet above the crown of the road. So all that means is you only need to be six and a half feet and you'd be following today's code. Think about that now. In Dorian, storm surges were about 25 feet. So to put that in perspective, you walk outside your house, if you live in, uh, let's say, a two-story house, and that's probably about up to your belt beam, right? Up to the bottom of your roof. If you live in a single story house, 25 feet is probably over your roof. So just imagine water above your roof. Now, can we all design our houses to withstand a Dorian? No. Will that happen anytime soon? No. So let's not, and you know, we have to be careful to, we don't take it to extreme. We're not, we can't design for 25 feet storm surge and expect, um, you know, the average person to be able to, to build something that can withstand that. But we can be able to raise our level of resilience, right? And that's why we raise our level of resilience by understanding where we are, our position, and what we can withstand. So under various scenarios, CAT 1, CAT 2, CAT 3, uh, out of various um, levels, we as, a, as professionals model that out and help to advise the government and stakeholders on how to, uh, when evacuations need to happen, for example, what areas should be evacuated. And to make sure that people take it seriously is obviously the cultural shift that we'll talk about a little more um, as we continue along. And so obviously working with nature and um, understanding where we need to allow, let's say, storm surge to come on the land and run back out, how to use the natural inundations, uh, undulations, the topography, et cetera, to create uh, more resilient communities that work with nature rather than trying to fight against it, because it will be a losing battle. 
um, but technology and um, especially engineering has advanced significantly in the past decade um, to help us to become more prepared. So obviously we've heard the wise man built his house upon the rock. Um, we can see that elevation really does matter. We've talked about it a good bit. And so even as we plan our communities um, in the islands, as well as in the Providence, it's important that we add obviously green space and we can use those green spaces to help um, to, to be the areas that, that are overflows during flooding and that can allow us to have the protection or the buffer that's needed um, in severe, in severe um, climate conditions. So it's better, obviously, as you can imagine, to build on rock. We can build anywhere, to be honest. It just adds to the price. Um, but elevation matters, right? The higher you are, and there's, as you can imagine, any study would prove that, um, then in theory, the safer you are, right? And this, once again, is location specific. I mean, obviously, if you're on top of East Street or Winton Hill building, 10 feet off the ground, if you're already 100 feet above sea level, probably doesn't serve you very much purpose. But if you're in a low-lying area of our country, and there are many of those, um, then that elevation would be a major factor that could honestly save your life one day. This is a photo that I took on the ground um, in Freeport after Hurricane Dorian. And I want you to take a look at it quickly and tell me if you can figure out what these two buildings have in common. And I want you to put it in the chat. What do you think these two buildings have in common in this photo? Oh, everybody's sleeping now, eh? Proximity to the shoreline, concrete, good. Location, good. Strong columns, great. Location, exactly. These two houses, some materials, excellent responses. They are neighbors. They're right next to each other. Remember the last thing we talked about was elevation. Look at the difference, right? Look at the difference. Remember this is hurricane, this is Dorian, right? Post Dorian in Grand Bahama. They're both on the water and they're right next to each other. Imagine your family is in this house versus this house. Now to do, and to be fair, from a professional standpoint, we obviously don't know the condition of the houses when either was built, but strictly look at the elevation. Do we think this house would have looked like this if it was built this high? Probably not, right? And as you can imagine with the house that seem to have survived and um, was built well above the floodplain. The waters would have probably flooded all underneath the house. Some might have been up to the house versus the other home where you can see the water came straight through like a bulldozer, right? So no matter, and to a certain extent, it's not fully fair, but to a certain extent it is, no matter how well built this house might or might not have been, and obviously we didn't have any pre-existing or post conditions. This is just me driving and assisting um, with response. Um, I'm snapping a photo. You can see that elevation is very important. So how can we raise the standards, right? Um, are we all really going to raise our houses? Probably not. But what we can do is to realize that we can build back better, right? So if this was where your home was and you see your neighbor doing that, then we have to learn, we have to adapt, we have to grow, right? And so from that, we have to pre prepare and think resiliency. Does that have a major economic impact? Yes, it does. But what is the cost of inaction? What is the cost not only to our bank accounts, but also to the things that matter most to us. Remember our why. If our families are in this home or in these homes, and we know we're going to be here for 10, 20, 30 years, because none of us build a house for it to only last us or serve us 10 years, right? We're building it for it to hopefully serve our entire lifetime and be passed on maybe to future generations. Then the decisions we make now 
the investments we make now can be the investments that pay returns significantly in the long run. So we might have to spend a little more now to save a lot more later. And the savings might be more than economic savings, but likely could be tied into saving our lives potentially, and definitely our property. When I was nine years old, my house burnt down. We heard and felt heat and crackling one night. And we, you know, the air conditioner was on and we looked out the window and everything was red. The house was already on fire. My dad was traveling at the time. My mom was there with my elderly grandfather. We packed up the few belongings we could grab, which is literally just the passports and helping him down the stairs. And we came out of the house to watch the entire house burn down. And, you know, we didn't get much insurance money, but people were very, very helpful. And um, the outreach and response was tremendous. But you know what was the biggest loss? The things can be replaced. You rebuy your furniture over time, you rebuy your clothes. It's the memories that you lose. It's the pictures of my grandmother, my great grandparents that were only the originals that were never scanned or anything like that. that are lost forever. It's the lines on the door where my mom would have had her height measured. And I do this with my three and a half year old daughter that's burnt down. So the memories are what's most valuable. And that's sometimes what we forget, right? Because those are the things that can't be replaced with money, right? So it's important to do what we can to play our part, um, to help to preserve our livelihoods as much as to preserve our way of life. So if you agree with me, put adapt to survive in the chat, please. Awesome. And if you agree with adapt to survive, put a survive to thrive. Because it's one thing to just survive, but we want to thrive. We have a blessed nation. We have a beautiful nation. And we don't want to just be here just barely making it. We want to thrive. So we will adapt to survive and we will survive to thrive. Now, I grew up in a church. Both of my parents are priests. So they would normally say something like, let me get an amen. So you could always drop an amen in there if, if, if this is making any type of sense to you. And uh, we're on the same page in terms of what we're talking about. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the response and feedback. You know, normally these presentations are done in person where you could have some feedback. So the most we could do is get our little texts and chats in there, right? So... I always like to bring it home and I have a, a few more slides. We're near the end um, for those who couldn't drop an amen and are sleeping. Um, those who are awake, uh, how do we deal with our houses as they are, right? Um, it's not practical to say we're all just going to move our houses and go to uh, up and live on top of the hill. It's not practical. We're all going to raise our houses 20 feet up in the air. So if a storm comes, not practical. Let's be real. So what are the simple things we can do? Right. And what are the simple, we're at the micro level now. So this is me, you, your cousin. You could go in your roof right now or when you get home and look and see if you have these little metal things around your rafters. So this is your rafter. This is your block. This is your, oh, you might not be able to see my mouse. Um, I hope you can see my mouse right now. But if you can't, then just imagine with me. You can see the rafters there. You can see your hurricane clip. Uh, that's a little piece of metal um, that is that helps to hold your roof down. Of all of the studies we've done, so we've done, uh, our company has done post-hurricane assessments after every major hurricane in the last 15 years, after every one. And we do it all pro bono to support NEMA and to do what we can towards our national advancement and to help to um, provide recommendations and papers on approving our um, state of infrastructure, et cetera, moving forward. And the number one reason for structural failure, failure in our houses in the Bahamas is a lack of hurricane clips. These little hurricane clips, these little metal things, 
costs probably for an entire house between $100 and $200. They're like $2 a clip. So we're talking whatever. Your house is anywhere from $200,000 to a few hundred thousand more or maybe even higher than that. Can you imagine losing everything because you didn't have $200 worth of clips? It's a very significant yet insignificant in price in the grand scope of things, but a very significant um, thing. And even if people might say, well, I don't have a house, I live in an apartment. Yeah, but if your apartment roof blows off, it's still your stuff that gets damaged. Oh, well, that's their problem. Yeah, but those memories and those pictures that we talked about, the laptop that has your, your um, the will on it, the laptop that has uh, the various work information, those things get damaged. And unless you've been through it, you don't really understand what gets lost when you lose everything. And so the reality of it is those small things are the big steps that you can do. And you don't, I'm not saying go and check in and tell me what the design calculation and confirm that, this, that they're good enough. No, just look and see if you could see the metal. If you don't see any metal, find somebody who is a contractor you trust or an engineer or an architect or mostly likely a contractor and let them check it. If they confirm you don't have it, then it's these little things called saddle clips that they can add, that can go around and they can help to either strengthen your existing clips or add the clips that you don't have, right? And if you know that you had a couple of shingles that blew off in the last storm or last wind, wind event, if you know you have that little soft spot on your ceiling, you know, the white ceilings, and uh, when you look and you see the little watermark, let somebody go and check that watermark. The little two, three, four hundred dollars, five hundred dollars that it costs to fix that one rotten piece of plywood. A sheet of plywood only costs you a couple hundred dollars to, to be installed. One rotten piece of plywood can be the cause for you to lose everything. So once again, you spend a little to save a lot. If you agree with me, drop that in the chat. Spend a little to save a lot. And let's remember too, we're talking in terms of money right now. We're not talking in terms of what it takes to survive. Let's remember, you are in your house, your roof starts to, to fail, your roof blows off. All of a sudden you packing up Grammy, you packing up your two or three kids, you try to grab the few possessions you have left to get out of your house in a hurricane. This is your fortress. This is your safe house. For a sheet of plywood, I think it's worth it. For some rusty nails, I think it's worth it. So remember, we take what we want seriously. We go on family vacations. It might even just be a little staycation. We prepare for Junkanoo. We do our little shopping, whether it's online or at the mall. So if we budget intentionally for the things that can save our life, then the payback and return will be infinitesimal. What are some other things we can do as we wrap up this section and I was told that I had 50 minutes, it's 3.43, so I have seven more minutes and then 10 minutes of question and answer. I like to stay on time and I like to uh, respect everybody's time. So we will finish on time today and we won't run a second over. And so what do we do to prepare for the storm? We now spoke at the macro level, how we are planning as a nation, how the private and public sector is improving our codes, our planning, our policies, and these things are in motion. These aren't things that are pie in the sky. Um, then we looked at the micro levels. We looked at how do we raise the bar? How do we plan? You're going to buy some property. You're going to develop Grammy property that she left you in the islands. Where should you be, et cetera? We talked about that. Then we looked at how do we prepare ahead of the storm in terms of uh, weeks ahead now, months ahead now. We're checking our hurricane clips. We're replacing any areas that are soft. We're checking to make sure that our doors swing outward and not inward. Very, very big thing outward and not inward. Uh, and we're making sure that we batten down and we have our hurricane shutters, right? And for those of us who have hurricane impact windows, right? Hurricane impact windows don't mean that they are rated for every hurricane. Let's remember a hurricane starts at what? 74, 75 miles an hour. Hurricane Dorian was 185 miles an hour. Do you think sitting in your house in your hurricane impact window house will protect you with your hurricane impact windows that are rated to category one? You think they will protect you against 185 miles an hour? I guarantee you they will not. So I would recommend 
And this is how we approach it. I always like to give examples uh, because I find that that's the most valid. Anything that is over a category two, I batten down. I have hurricane impact windows as well. I batten down because once again, yes, my windows might be rated. Yes, they might be installed. And yes, they might've been certified, but ultimately things happen. And what am I willing to gamble on with my family? I'll say that again. What am I willing to gamble on with my family? So I'll take chances in life. But I, if it can do anything preventative, if it costs me an extra couple hundred dollars to get some plywood, to be safe, uh, a bit beyond safe, to be comfortable, a bit beyond comfortable, and it doesn't mean that nothing else will happen. But if that is all it takes, then I'm willing to add that extra couple dollars to my budget to make sure that, once again, we are over-prepared for the storm. And we'll look, the last slide before we close will be a quick checklist uh, of things you can look at. So if you're going to stick with just hurricane-rated uh, windows and doors, make sure they're Miami-Dade rated. So Miami-Dade rated is about 175 miles an hour. Our code here is 180 in the Bahamas. So for the most part, that's as close as you can get. Uh, and that is the highest standard of hurricane protection. Um, so that is obviously the most expensive. I don't have Miami-Dade rated because I couldn't afford to spend $50,000 on windows and doors. So I got less than a Miami-Dade rated and I spent a couple hundred dollars on plywood and, um, and clips. So that's the path I took, same effect, but different budget. So if you can afford Miami-Dade rated for your entire home, that is the gold standard. Uh, if you're going to use plywood, for example, obviously there's different types of shingles, um, sorry, shutters, et cetera, that you can get, you know, the fancy roll down ones, uh, the fancy ones that you wind down. I couldn't afford $17,000 in shutters when I moved into our house in 2014. So I have plywood and I still have it today. Is it as effective? Yes, it is when you install it properly. And so you notice there's no nails. Those are bolts because bolts into your the frame of your window or door is what you need because i see somebody dropping a note preparation is key you got it preparation is key and so um, use exterior grade plywood it doesn't make sense using things that can't aren't meant to be outside it doesn't make sense right uh, your shingles make sure that they are high bond strength or paint your roof so you can paint it with some type of mastic that helps to save energy like for example if it's white or it also helps to keep your shingles down. Use uh, galvanized and stainless steel connections, et cetera, as much as possible. Um, can you use oil? Maybe, maybe not, but at least the ones that are exposed to the elements. Um, build the lowest floor as high as possible. We spoke about that extensively earlier. We looked at obviously the photos and the evidence that show what that means to be higher. And make sure that you maintain your waterproofing especially around windows and doors. And we talked about the soft spots on the ceiling. Let somebody who knows what they're doing go up, check what's happening and do the little repairs that are needed. Make sure that repairs are a standard part of your household plan each year. Because remember, you have, if you don't service your car, your car will break down. That's a fact. I mean, if you don't ever change your oil, your car will break down. If you don't do repairs on your house, when you need your house to withstand the elements, it will fail. And it won't fail because it wasn't well built. It will fail because it wasn't well maintained. It will fail, I'll repeat that, not because it wasn't well built. It will fail because it was not well maintained. This is a checklist that shows, uh, and this is one that I use for my house. It's on NEMA's website. You know, NEMA is obviously our national emergency uh, management agency. And it's simple. It's not, you don't need to be an engineer to follow it. Um, it is right there if you just Google it or go on NEMA's website and it has the simple things you need, right? To do what to do, what to do outside, what to do inside and the basic checklist of things that you should make sure that you have, right? And I always remind people, and this is important, please, please, in storms, things happen quickly. If your window blows out, your door blows in, your roof blows off, you don't have time. Please keep the things that you need on the go in a go bag. And that's not in a bin. 
If your roof's blowing off and the wind's blowing 100 miles an hour, you don't have time to carry a bin. You need to grab a waterproof backpack that your things are already in, including your food. If your food is in the cupboard and your roof blows off, what good is that food doing you? The last thing you're thinking about is, oh, let me go grab that canned tuna and put it in my pocket when you're trying to grab your family and stop them from blowing away. So we need to be real with ourselves and be prepared. Please put your stuff in a waterproof bag and put that on the counter so that if you needed to, you can grab it and go and have all of the things, just like if you're a special secret service agent or a special agent in your go bag, your passport, uh, Grammy will, whatever is important in a waterproof backpack. You can get one of them for $50 and make sure you have that. Okay. And so we spoke about a lot of things. We spoke about the macro level, we spoke about the micro level, and we spoke about the individual level. So the reality is that the cost of damage without mitigation is high, $500 million a year. And the cost of damage will happen. It's not really if it will happen, it's a matter of when it will happen again. So if we spend a little bit, we can save a good bit, right? And this is monetarily, but also in terms of our lives, in terms of our um, sanity, in terms of our survival, because remember, we want to what? Survive to thrive, right? So the net benefit of budgeting those little repairs, of changing out or upgrading those hurricane clips, uh, getting the waterproof bags, or let's say life vests for our family, these are the small incremental steps that each one of us can take so that we are better prepared for when the next hurricane comes. So I thank you so much. I hope most of you are still awake. I appreciate obviously the invite, the energy. And if there are any questions, I'm here to provide them or answer them. And um, I thank you so much for your attention today. Thank you so much, Carlos. Um, I can tell you how much information you've shared with the family at Family Guardian. Um, it was really informative, insightful. I see a lot of people um, excited, um, just commenting in the chat group, um, saying great presentation, wow, true facts, all of these things, um, just the exuberance and the enthusiasm from the family at Family Guardian is really good. And we thank you very much for presenting and sharing your knowledge and tips with us. And we do have a few questions. Um, the first question we have is, from Estelle who asks, um, she has Spanish tiles and she wanted to know what would be the equivalent clip for Spanish tile roof? So Spanish tile roofs, great question. Thank you for that. Are typically from a structural standpoint below that would still have your regular rafters um, that would have your hurricane clips below that. So the Spanish tiles are just on the outside. So you can have shingles, you can have Spanish tiles, you can have architectural, et cetera, different styles. You can even have you know, nice wood finished tiles uh, that some people have. So that doesn't really matter. Your clips are still inside. So you'll see those from in your ceiling. So when you go in your ceiling and you cut a flashlight on and you crawl over to the corner to look and see if you see any metal. Or if you don't wanna do that or don't have the capacity, just get somebody who's in the construction industry to check and go and tell you, do you see my hurricane clips? Um, but it's independent of what you have on the outside of your roof. We're talking about what holds the roof down from the inside. So I hope that answers your question. The next question we have is sure. where can where can um, where where do people purchase um, the clips from? Uh, any any building store in the Bahamas would sell those. So JBR, Kelly's, Tops, anybody who sells building supplies um, would sell them. Most companies that would sell lumber would have them. Uh, and once again, I, I wouldn't suggest you just go and buy them yourselves because they really should be installed one and specced to the size roof that you have. So not all clips are the same. If your house is, let's say, bigger than somebody else's. So let's say your the span of your roof is 20 feet versus somebody's roof that's 40 feet, then you'll have a different size clip. What I'm saying is just see if you have clips, period. And then if you want, you know, a professional opinion, you can obviously have, uh, like I said, a contractor or an engineer or someone come and check it. Or if you want to are concerned about them at all, then have somebody come and do an assessment um, of your, your property for you. But uh, I wouldn't recommend you go and buy the clips and install them yourselves. But any, like I said, reputable contractor would get them for you and put them in for you. Okay, we have one more question. Um, is it safe to build near the beaches given how much stronger hurricanes are? 
It is. We can build anywhere. The cost of building near the beach is higher. So if you can afford it, it's the reality of it, to build resiliently, yes, no problem. You can build anywhere. I can build a house on the water for you if you want. It might cost you a lot more, but you can build anywhere. Okay. Um, the person says they saw a tornado land earlier this morning. How best can we protect our home against tornado damage? So tornadoes are tricky and I am not a subject matter expert on tornadoes. So um, I won't pretend to be or answer that in a technical standpoint. Um, but I would say this, if you take the steps we discussed to help to protect you from hurricanes, that definitely gets you a lot closer to being protected against tornadoes. But we don't actively design for tornadoes currently in the Bahamas. Okay, next question. Could you explain why it's best for the doors to swing outward and not inward? So great question once again. Um, imagine the, okay, let's put it this way. The easiest way to think about it is, and this is for your safety as well. A robber can kick a door in but they can't kick it if it swings out. So the same way somebody can walk up and run and drop kick your door and sw it'll swing open is the same way the wind at 180 miles an hour can blow it open or a tree limb can blow into the door and rip it in open or the weight of the water, let's say the water was um, building up outside your door can swing it in. And also our code says your door is supposed to swing outward, just so you know. So if you're door swings inward, that's actually against the building code for all of the reasons I just explained, for personal safety, as well as for environmental um, matters. Okay, um, I just have a question around uh, regulation and building codes. How, how compliant are we in um, building our structures to the building code presently and how far away are we from a regulatory standpoint from being where we need to be regu regulation wise um, to, to, guard, to be better prepared for hurricanes? Great question, John. Let's get back to our culture. We're Bahamians. What rules do we really follow that we're really good at following? I always like to ask us that because we kind of like to pick and choose. We run the light. It's supposed to be illegal to use your cell phones. I see the police driving in front of me on their phone. You know, I, let's also be real, right? So we still have cultural challenges that we need to overcome. Are people all building to the code? No. Do most people build to the code? Yes. But let's remember the challenge. You build your house today, once again, but the code is outdated within anywhere from five years to 10 years. The last version of our code was in 2003, just to put it in perspective. Wow. Our code does reference other codes though. Like, so for the wind design, our code references Miami-Dade, which is, which is why our standards are similar, which means it is updated. So that's good. But what that means is if you live in a house that's kind of 10 years, let's say five to 10 years or older, your house currently is not built to today's code not even to future conditions. So the same way we have to upgrade certain aspects of our life or upgrade our, 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 our cars or things like that, we also need to upgrade our homes to retrofit and to keep them up at least to a standard that we're happy with. Because you'll build today, but your house will be outdated in 10 to 20 years or 15 years or five years, depending on when the next iteration of the codes come out. Okay, thank you.